I have only two words to say. <laughs> only two? Ted Nelson. <laughs> I asked Lee how long I could speak, and he said 15 minutes. So I timed this out to exactly 15 minutes, speaking rather rapidly. So I'd like a show of hands, because he said now I could be a little longer. Who would like full speed? Who would like slow? Who would like in between? Oh, I think in between us. I want to thank Lee Felsenstein for inviting me and thank my wonderful wife, Marlene, for making everything possible. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here. Amazed to be asked. I had no idea of any connection to homebrew until Lee invited me. <laughs> I was never in a meeting. But it seems many of you will remember this book. They're very scarce. The first edition is now 296 bucks on Amazon at least yesterday. <laughs> that just won't do. So we've just reprinted the original edition, shrink wrapped, for quite a bit less than the Amazon price and a special deal for a carton of 25. <clears throat> I asked Lee for a statement of the connection between Computer Lab and the Homebrew Club. In his inimitable style, he, wrote, he writes, <clears throat> Of the attendees to the Homebrew Computer Club, Ted's Computer Lib was by far the common text of the plurality. <laughs> what more could I ask? <laughs> He's asked me to tell what led up to Computer Lab and describe the dark ages that came before the homebrew computer. <laughs> so, what led up to Computer Lab? I'm not a programmer. I'm a software designer. You are familiar with only one of my designs. The back button. <laughs> What's that you say? It's obvious? I totally agree. But in 1966, it was obvious to only one person in the world. I had to fight for it. <laughs> the other members of the team said users would never understand it. <laughs> I started as a media guy. I may have been the first teenager to own a 35 millimeter single lens reflex, and the first teenager to own a tape recorder back in 1950. By the time I got out of college, I had acted on TV in the professional stage, I had published my first book and produced a long playing record. And in fact, I was already a kind of media innovator in college. When I was 19, I put out a kite-shaped magazine. When I was 20, I wrote and directed what I believe was the first rock musical. You can read about it on the web and hear a couple of numbers. When I was 21, I shot a 30-minute movie, a slightly surrealistic comedy about loneliness in college and the meaning of life. <laughs> because it was badly synced, I had no other options in 1959. Most people can't stand it. But it has a plot, atmosphere, a lovable hero, and it actually does tell you the meaning of life. <laughs> and it's there on YouTube for your enjoyment. So how the hell did I get into this field? As it happens, I remember my first contact with the computer. It was an article in Time magazine, which my grandfather subscribed to, with a cover by Art Sebastian showing a computer wearing an Admiral's hat. Hello. <laughs> okay. Worked work before. Okay. Anyway, 
you saw it for a moment. <laughs> I was 12, and I just found the, found the picture on the web. <clears throat> I was puzzled by the article. Here's how the article started. Time will give you the first couple of paragraphs for free. <clears throat> <laughs> on Oxford Street in Cambridge, Mass, lives a Sybil, a priestess of science. Skipping a little. She is a long, slim, glass-sided machine with 760,000 parts, and the riddles that are put to her and that she unfailingly answers concern such matters as rocket motors, nuclear physics, and trigonometric functions. <laughs> I could not fathom how a machine could do all that. A year and a half later, in the fall of 1951, my grandfather and I went to an exhibit of Da Vinci models at the IBM showroom on Madison Avenue. And there we walked through the IBM SSEC, the Selective Sequence Electronic Calculator. As I recall, its 10,000 or 12,000 vacuum tubes glowed blue. But I still didn't know what the hell it was about. Or that Selective Sequence meant that they had just added Branching instructions. <laughs> Nine years later, in graduate school, I took a computer course and went crazy. Everything I'd heard about computers was a lie. <laughs> they weren't mathematical. They weren't scientific. They were electric trains you could run in circles. You could put screens on them with interaction. I was a movie guy. That was all I needed to know. I said, I can do this. Within months, I'd come up with the idea we now call the World Wide Web, but with a twist. The documents had to be connectable side by side and comparable side by side. That was the new literature I foresaw. And because people have such a difficult time imagining it, Let's just see what it would look like if it existed. Here we have a document in 3D. We've got some OpenGL happening here. We've got two front pages. The one on the left with the larger type is the current page. The one on the right with the lesser type is the companion page. And you see every quotation is connected as it should be to its original context. In the beginning, God created the heaven. Let's get closer. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And that is from. Yeah, sorry. And that is from the King James Bible. Oops. <clears throat> next down, next one down. Adam and Lilith immediately began to fight. I can't get into that. <clears throat> she said, I will not lie below. What is that from? That is from the alphabet of Ben Sira. And so, in this imaginary space, which of course is impossible to program, we see <laughs> the connections coming up side by side of links and transclusions. That is the same content visible in both places. Now, I coined the word transclusion. It's become widely used. What, I'm, what I mean by transclusion, Xanadu transclusion means you can see the original context side by side. But of course, this is impossible. Anybody knows that. And in fact, we're stuck in prototype hell trying to make this a product. We paid for a cross-platform application and we got the Windows demo. <laughs> but it's very pretty, isn't it? You can even fly through and look at all the, all the links and transclusion beams. You can even turn, turn the camera. 
<laughs> watch this. We'll just watch the back ones as, as we go up and down. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> that was my vision. Furthermore, I wanted everything to be freely quotable in any quantity without red tape. But of course, it had to be under copyright law. I'd already run afoul of copyright. For one, in one instance, um, uh, I had written to a, a magazine and wanted to reprint something of theirs, and I found out how difficult, how much red tape was involved. In another instance, Playboy copied a cartoon out of one of my magazines, and I just didn't have the... I could have probably collected $100 if I'd gotten the letter right in. But copyright law was there and was not going to go away, and I knew this. So the idea, what? Okay. Yeah, all right, well, we're not arguing tonight. You're listening. <laughs> and I'm talking about 1962. <laughs> Further, because I wanted everything to be freely quotable in any quantity without red tape, and it had to be under copyright law, the idea was that the content could be sold in arbitrary selections. The reader bought only the paragraph or chapter or sentence that the author was quoting from the other document. I hoped this micro-sale of content would create a principled and motivated online publishing industry. So that was my big idea in 1960. It was a pretty hard sell in 1960. <laughs> it still is. <laughs> I knew there would be a personal computer industry, it was obvious. I knew it because I knew guys love electric trains. And I intended to found the personal computer industry. I planned to create a company called General Creative that would have what we now call an Apple-like image. Note that Steve Jobs was five years old at the time. But it didn't work out that way. For the next decade and a half, I would say to people, soon we'll be reading and writing on computer screens. And there'll be new forms of publication for the screen, and, and you'll be able to call up any document out of millions, and everyone will be able to publish in this new medium, and there'll be many new kinds of connection among them, and you'll be able to see every quotation in its original context, and you'll be able to quote without limit, without permission, and there'll be an automatic royalty to every author for the part they wrote. People would usually stare for a while and say, is it like a tape? <laughs> I should have just said yes. Actually, I ran into Asimov at a party in 1961, I believe, uh, given by John W. Campbell, and uh, I said, Mr. Asimov, soon we'll be reading and writing on computer screens. And the great futurist said, yeah, sure. <laughs> it turned out that nobody could imagine interactive screens. Nobody else could imagine the interactive screens, let alone what to do with them. So I kept studying and designing until 1965 when I started publishing papers. I believe that most of the world's computer scientists were in the room when I read my main paper at the ACM National Conference. It was peer-reviewed, by the way, and it got terrific applause. A few days later, I was approached by the Central Intelligence Agency, and they said they would back me. So I thought it would be a walk in the park to get the kind of system I wanted. Now, why would I accept the money from the CIA? Well, if they're giving the money to me, it's not murdering anybody, right? <laughs> but that backing turned into repeated requests for proposals, and I found myself in what Hollywood calls development hell. Trying to get backing, and keep the project to its original vision if you do get backing. I should point out that even the great Douglas Engelbart, after his fabulous demo in 1968, soon was thrown into development hell for the rest of his career, 30 odd years. So it hits all of us, it can. If I had known there would be no hope for the path I'd chosen, I would have made a beeline to Roger Corman, the great producer of cheap old movies, and broken into the field I loved with him, as many did, and maybe come back with money of my own. Yeah. Unfortunately, I stayed in the computer field. 
I worked for the president of Harcourt Publishers, and, they, and he considered backing me, but he went with a CI, CAI system instead, computer assistance instruction. I worked in a hypertech system at Brown, and for my pains was pushed out of the field, I found it. In 1971, I filed a patent application for CGI hardware, but ran out of money to pursue it. It might have gotten me royalties from ILM before it ran out in 1990, we'll never know. My patent advisor correctly guessed that software would be patentable as, quote, methods. In 1972, I had the first word processor, almost. I and a colleague, Cal Daniels, were nearly market ready with what could have been the first word processor ever to run on the Nova. I later learned that we were neck and neck with Wang till our backer dropped out. This system had two special features. One was the first enfilade, a tree structure for rearranging external text content without moving it, which is both parsimonious and efficient, especially for large bodies of text. Thank you. I believe that uh, Microsoft later came up with this idea under the name, oh well. No, 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 it's, but, the, but uh, uh, Peace Table. <laughs> the other was the Jot interface, a very different word processing interface that allowed you to skip over words, sentences, and paragraphs. The three people besides me who tried it loved the feel and confirmed my belief that I could predict the feel of my software before it was programmed, which many say is impossible. But with all these disasters, by 1973, I was really down. I was a dozen years into my computer odyssey and getting nowhere fast. Then I was hired by the University of Illinois to work with Project Plato. And I looked at it, and I hated Project Plato. So I decided to write a book instead, and that was Computer Lib, which I wrote mostly first draft on various typewriters. Thank you, thank you. And pasted up on a table in the living room. Computer Lib had three purposes. One, to set me free to get my own software program so I wouldn't have to take irrelevant jobs, the dream of every artist. <laughs> Two, to find backing for my software designs, some of which I laid out in detail, involving parallelism and side-by-side -side intercomparison, <clears throat> especially my Xanadu document design, developing, them from the developing from that original vision of 1960 years, side by side, in a comparison, and micro sale of content. Thank you. Gee, <laughs> this is like a political. This is like a national political convention. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the official purpose of the book: three, to proclaim a new era of interactive computing and graphics, so the public would understand. <laughs> oh my gosh. None of these purposes succeeded. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, Computer Lib was a complete failure. As to objective one, financial independence, Computer Lib sold 50,000 copies, but I didn't see the money and was not in a position to sue the distributors. As to objective two, backing from my designs, nothing happened on the horizon. Uh, I was still very naive about backing. Nobody seemed to understand that I had any technical smarts despite all the technicalities I explained and nobody gave a hoot about my design. As to objective three, informing the public, it turned out that the general public couldn't read my book. <laughs> Even my grandfather, who's a very intelligent man, couldn't understand what I was talking about. But, computer lib showed people in a number of fields that they were part of a new wave that would sweep the world. And it laid out sound principles for what is now called HCI, or human-computer interaction. Should be called human construct interaction since the computer has no nature. It's the constructs we apply. We apply to it. And Computer Lib inspired a lot of other people to implement their designs. I would feel better about this if my designs had been implemented soon. <laughs> I believe that if Computer Lib had succeeded, it would be a far different world today, not just a different computer world. I'll skip the rest of the story. I fight on, I pretty much let go of every other objective except decently connected documents, rather than today's model of decorated rectangles, the costume party of fonts, <laughs> and the retrograde simulation of paper, the nadir of which are e-books. <laughs> Still trying to make a product out of Xanadu space, which I've shown you. It has now, by the way, been <laughs> transcoded from C++ with some rather ghastly, uh, ill-chosen optimizations. 
and has now been transcoded to Python, and uh, the tentative plan is to put it out under GPL and a private license. I've kept on because I believe the human race needs parallel documents and decent <coughs> workflow. And I, and I hope to live long enough to have the last laugh when people finally understand writing, workflow, interconnection, and posterity. So much for the origins of computer lib. Let's talk about what Lee calls the dark ages. <clears throat> the state of the world before <laughs> personal computing. Now, computing has always been personal in that all the participants have taken it personally. <laughs> I would talk about Unix, which many people took personally, but that would be too broad a topic. I would love to go into the fascinating history of computers. You might enjoy my book, Geeks Bearing Gifts. Yes, that is a photograph of Bill Gates under arrest in Albuquerque. We don't know what for, the records have disappeared. <laughs> Perhaps you know how IBM began. Herman Hollerith, a mining engineer living in Manhattan, now that's suspicious already, <laughs> got into electrical counting, and I believe his punched cards were used in the census of 1888. His company went on to become International Computers and Tabulators, and that became IBM, International Business Machines, under Thomas J. Watson, a ferocious salesman and righteous preacher type. Now, most people think the first computer was the UNIVAC. The first commercial computer was the UNIVAC, which developed by, <clears throat> came out of the ENIAC project, the top secret ENIAC project at, uh, at uh, Moore School, uh, University of Pennsylvania. It's very interesting, by the way, that computers were being developed during World War II in various degrees of top secrecy and, and completely op complete openness. And whether anybody was spying on it, we'll never know. Anyway, most people think the first commercial computer was UNIVAC. Actually, the first commercial computer was produced in Nazi Germany by Konrad Zuse, a great computer scientist insufficiently recognized. I should stress that Zuse had clean hands, unlike von Braun. <clears throat> so UNIVAC was the first commercial computer company in the USA. And it's in its signal first public appearance, UNIVAC predicted the 1952 election correctly. Interestingly, John Mockley wrote the code while he was forbidden to enter his own company because he was under scrutiny for left-wing connections. It was still the McCarthy era. But IBM took over with their ferocious sales and extraordinary corporate culture. My wife was at IBM in the 60s and found it a wonderful experience and a fabulous working environment. But IBM perfected a remarkable system of corporate capture. They would train the computer department of the company whose members then became the loyal slaves of IBM, totally opposed to any competitive equipment or software, which if introduced would lose those employees their expertise and job qualifications. So IBM was deeply entrenched wherever it sank its roots. In recent years, Microsoft and Adobe, among others, have re-implemented this system of captivity. There were other computer companies. DEC, which pioneered the mini computer and graphical screens, marketed to engineering departments. They didn't try to, they didn't try to market against IBM. SDS, which broke off from DEC to build serial machines that were cheaper and Burroughs, which made stack-oriented machines that were by far the best, but nobody knew. Yay, Burroughs! Yeah! Yay. <laughs> There's no point in trying to mention them all, but they were called Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs because, <clears throat> because the grace and beauty of IBM compared to the others was so grand. <laughs> now, I'm conspiracy-minded. I thought from about 1970 to 1979 that IBM was deliberately suppressing personal I later learned that they didn't have a clue. <laughs> they thought computers had to be run by big, de big departments. I found this out in the late 70s when they asked me to consult on whether they should get into personal computing. <laughs> so then, at last, came the dinkies. The Altair was announced the month after Computer Lib came out. So the, we, the chips were available, but no one had actually put it together into a machine. And actually, the Altair didn't work either. What happened was, Ed Roberts 
designed this thing. He, he had a model, model airplane control company in Albuquerque, I think it was, and he designed the so-called S-100 bus and uh, computer around the, uh, the uh, what was it, the 8008 chip from Intel and advertised it as the Altair computer and figured that he could save his bankrupt company if he sold 400 units. And that many orders came in on the first day because of the great thirst and hunger out in the public. They knew computers were something they wanted, even if they didn't know what it was. But the Altair didn't work. The first working Altair, is my understanding, <coughs> came about in this way. Somebody couldn't make it work, came to the Albuquerque headquarters of MITS in his camper, marched into Roberts with the kit, and made him debug it so it finally worked. <laughs> And then came processor technology and, and, and uh, IMSI and all the rest using the S100 bus. And I thought that was going to work well. <clears throat> so the Dinkies became the lifeblood of the Homebrew Computer Club. This is my understanding. I wasn't here. That era of hope and joy was our Arab Spring. <laughs> Little did we foresee that the Xerox Park model would lock down the world with the so-called modern GUI, a fig leaf on the operating system which prevents almost anything. <laughs> and the modern GUI, which has convinced the world that the purpose of computers is to simulate paper and its decorations. <laughs> and little did we foresee today's ignorant rabble reveling in social media. <laughs> or today's online monopolies. Or today's nightmare honky-tonk prison of online bread and circuses and playlists. Thank you very much.